Hello, and thank you for tuning in to the first ever Unlocking Landscapes podcast episode. I'm your host, Daniel Greenwood, and I'm really excited to launch this pod and talk to some of the amazing people we have lined up. In January 2021, at what we hope is the height of the UK's COVID crisis, I spoke to author Chris Shuler over Zoom about his upcoming book on London's historic Great North Wood. His most recent book, Along the Amber Route, St. Petersburg to Venice, published in February 2020, has been shortlisted for the Bookmark Book of the Year 2020 and longlisted for the Jewish Quarterly Wingate Prize 2021. He is also the author of Writers, Lovers, Soldiers, Spies, A History of the Authors Club of London, 1891-2016, and Three Illustrated Histories of Cartography. He has written on literature, travel and the arts for The Independent, The Independent on Sunday, The Tablet, The Financial Times and The New Statesman, served as chairman of the Authors Club from 2008 to 2015 and was elected a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society in 2011. Chris's upcoming book is a historical account of the Great North Wood, a cluster of ancient woodlands and green spaces that connected five boroughs in South London. We need to give a shout out to London Wildlife Trust, as well as local volunteer groups and local councils, who have invested decades of work in conserving and enhancing significant tracts of the Great North Wood, and in making them safely accessible for public enjoyment. One of these woodlands is thought to have over 300,000 annual visits, underlining its huge importance on both an environmental and social level. So, hello, Chris. Hi, Daniel. Um, welcome to the first episode of the Unlocking Landscapes podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thank you very much for asking me. The first question I have for you um, is, where are you right now? Uh, I'm in a sitting room in Herne Hill. Uh, if I open the French windows to the garden, I can actually see Sydenham Hill Wood from here. Uh, Sydenham Hill Wood. So for those of you who don't know, Sydenham Hill Wood is one of the the largest remaining remnants of the Great North Wood, which is um, the subject of Chris's upcoming book, The Wood That Built London. And so, of course, at the moment in England, we can't really go anywhere. Um, we're supposed to, we're told to stay at home and we can only really go out for food and exercise and other things. A small number of other things. Um, what have you been up to recently? Well, um, to be perfectly honest, mostly I've been at home uh, reading, writing and editing. I mean, I do. I mean, we're lucky here in that uh, we do have a garden and uh, it's quite a leafy area. So, you know, I can go for walks around the block and uh, I tend to avoid the parks, unfortunately, because they are far too busy but uh, you know twilight walk through quiet streets is a uh, nice refreshing way after to spend a bit of time after a day's work yeah i've um on a couple of occasions i've gone out in the in the night time to uh, just walk through the town um where i live in west sussex and yeah it's been really empty um it's it's very very strange, isn't it? These sort of it's not as it's not as empty as it was back May in uh, or April or something like that, but it's still it's still fairly empty compared with how it was in sort of November time. Um, mm. So your garden is very important to you, then. Of course, gardens in in London are a, a really important part of the urban ecosystem. Do you um, do you see a lot of wildlife in your garden? Um, foxes nearly every day, red squirrels. Uh, sorry, grey squirrels, red squirrels, that would be something. Um, what else? Bird life. Uh, robins regularly, wrens, uh, magpies, a lot of magpies around. Um, wood pigeons, of course. I heard blackbirds singing the other day as well, and it's just starting up again. Um, they're the usual London garden birds, basically. Occasionally we see blue tits and great tits. Didn't you get a fox video on Springwatch once or something like that on the news? Uh, yes, it wasn't mine. It was a neighbour uh, two doors up who actually had a fox cam 
installed, which was broadcast live on uh, on Simon King's personal website. And it caught a burglar climbing over a fence. <laughs> Unluckiest burglar in South London. <laughs> that's, that's why I remember it. That is a, that's a great story. Yeah. Um, I heard a blackbird singing just when I went out for a walk. I actually had one singing outside my window all through the winter. And we, I live near a railway line, so um, I think it's because of the light pollution. Um, but yeah, it's nice to hear it in, in the daytime. It shows you that spring's coming as well. So, Chris, we're going to be talking about your upcoming book, The Wood That Built London, which is about the Great North Wood. You are a professional writer. Um, but yeah, what's, what is your work like? Well, I'm a writer and editor. I mean, I do a lot of editorial work as well. I think um, a lot of people don't aren't really aware that many published writers uh, can't really subsist on their earnings from their books alone. And uh, quite often there's a long time delay as well between doing the work and, uh, and getting paid. So, which is why so many writers do you know, bits of journalism or teach creative writing or various other things. Uh, I, well, I've worked in publishing in one guise or another since I left university. Magazines, uh, I worked on the independent newspaper for 10 years and uh, I've done a lot of work for various book publishers. Uh, project managing particularly complex illustrated books and uh, copy editing the text. Uh, in between that, you know, I've written several books of my own and uh, the most recent one along the Amber Route uh, came out last February. Uh, it's a travelogue through Eastern and Central Europe. Yeah, so basically it's, it's not a bad balance, really. And I think the editorial work probably helps give me a certain objectivity about my own writing. Um, so you've, you've been writing for quite a long time then. Um, um, you have sent me a copy of um, of your book. And I think I said to you earlier before we start, before we press the record button, that I'd got about halfway through it um, in about a week. Um, and I'm just really amazed by the level of detail about that part of South London and the, the details about when the woods were cut in the... I just can't remember how far back it was, 15 something. And, you know, every 10 years the woods were cut. And, and it just strikes me that the, the level of um, motivation required to research something like that is quite impressive. And, you know, what is it that motivates you and inspires you to, to write a book like that? Um, curiosity, I think. You know, I've, you know, really interested in finding stuff out. And then, of course, you know, once you've done it, you, one thing leads to another as well. Um, and then, of course, you think, you know, what can I what can I make of this? What can I do with this? How can I share it with as many people as possible? I mean, I started out sort of making that little film that you've seen about the Great Northwood. And by the time I put that together, I realized that there was far more. There was actually enough to make a book and there was material as well that uh, maybe didn't lend itself to uh, a short documentary film that could be explored in more detail in a full length book. So yeah, I mean, we're lucky. We're very lucky with the, uh, with the great North wood in that uh, we have surviving records. I mean, we know from the, biological evidence that it is um, parts of it are ancient woodland because they do have ancient woodland indicator species such as uh, wood and enemy and so forth but uh, we also have a written documentary record because uh, large parts of it particularly Dulwich and Sydenham woods belong has belonged to the Dulwich estate since the beginning of the 17th century and they managed it uh, for timber production on a rotational coppicing basis. And the southern portions of the wood belong to the Archbishop of Canterbury because the Archbishops of Canterbury were also lords of the manor of Croydon. And uh, they were doing the same thing. And fortunately, both institutions still exist and their records survive. Um, the uh, Records of the Dulwich Estate are in Dulwich College itself in their archive. 
and the records of the Archbishop of Canterbury are in Lambeth Palace Library. So I spent a great deal of time in both uh, going through these documents, which are mostly mostly accounts. That's how we, I mean, it's the coppicing has probably been done since at the very least Anglo-Saxon times, but it's only once you get to the 17th century that you really do have a detailed written record of it that tells you which coppice was felled in which year and how much money was raised by selling the timber. And uh, so that in, of, in and of itself is, is fascinating, but it's also evidence for the uh, you know, woodland management practices that were followed over, over centuries. Can you tell us what coppicing is, Chris? Yes, it is cutting down of a tree at, uh, just above ground level and then allowing it to reshoot. It doesn't work with conifers, but it works with, they chop them down at the base, they die. But most deciduous trees will send out vigorous new shoots. Uh, these are left to grow for, depends on the, depending on the species, about 10 years, by which time they will be thick, strong, flexible poles that are very useful for all manner of things, and particularly Prior to the Industrial Revolution, they they were used to make uh, hurdles to fence in livestock, uh, wattles for the um, infill of a timber frame house, which can be covered in plaster. Uh, they were used for axles and spokes, for chair legs, table legs, uh, tool handles, sort of, you know, practically anything you can think of that requires a strong round piece of timber sort of up to two two and a half inches thick what happened in most woods was that they were divided the term coppice applies both to the uh, to the practice of uh, coppicing and to the uh, individual plant it also applies to an area of coppices uh, and most woods were divided, which were regularly harvested on this basis, were divided into a number of coppices that were done in rotation. So that, uh, and in fact, in Dulwich woods, there were 10 coppices. So by the time the 10th had been felled, the first were, had grown up to the extent that it was ready for felling once more. So they so they simply felled them in a cycle, and uh, from the estates in Dulwich, from from the records in Dulwich College, you can actually I've been able to recreate the cycle. That's fascinating. Um, I, I'm wondering before before we talk more in detail about the Great North Wood, I'm sure there'll be people listening to this and wondering, you know, what is the Great North Wood? How could that ever be in London, which is in the south of England? We can get into that stuff, but. Um, I'm just wondering how you think the kind of information that you've been finding about woodland management and land management, you know, why that's important today and why, you know, is there a way that that can be used to um, to support and sort of direct, not direct, that's, that's a bit too much, but um, kind of inform is the word I'm looking mm -hmm. for, the management of, of the Great North Wood today. Yeah, well, I think it already does um, because uh, the well, as you well know, the London Wildlife Trust have been uh, coppicing hazel in Sydenham Hill Wood for some years now. Uh, the reason these practices are valuable is that they uh, created a, a unique range of habitats. Because if you think about it, you've got ten coppices in the sense of areas all adjacent to each other all in different stages of growth so there are actually 10 quite distinct habitats there and uh, as we know uh, the most uh, biodiverse areas in terms of uh, both plants and animals are the margins of specific habitats the margins of woodland where they meet a glade and so forth. So um, an area of coppice woodland, although it was created entirely for 
human convenience had the and um, for productivity had the welcome side effect of producing this uh, very diverse biosphere and the coppice poles all growing very closely together you know provide lots of wonderful crevices for insects as well so uh, once the industrial revolution took place the oh the other um the other purpose of the coppicing was to provide charcoal which was the commonest source of fuel until uh well until the construction of the canals meant that coal could be easily transported from the north of england to the south uh, once you get the industrial revolution uh demand for woodland products falls off dramatically uh things that used to be made of wood were now made of iron or steel and so this wood management declined uh, and what you then get in areas like the surviving remnants of the great north wood is uh, very overgrown wood with a dense canopy uh, and not much in the way of understory and uh, not especially biodiverse so in a way uh, you know the reserve officers and the volunteers are trying to some extent to recreate the diverse habitat created by the ancient practices of woodland management it's quite interesting isn't it because there'll be people who who listen to that sort of information and and they'll be like hang on i thought nature doesn't need people and you know nature nature can do it all on its own i know that uh, rewilding is very is becoming very much sort of mainstream and popular now um but it's it's much more subtle than that i know that um some people think the woodlands shouldn't be managed at all but you know as you say the evidence does show that a lot of woodlands that are that were once managed um intensively in a more sustainable way do produce you know greater more diverse populations of species so um yeah it's always it's interesting kind of looking at those different perspectives and there's oft, often sort of a clash there isn't there um you mentioned iron i thought that was quite interesting because i um i used to live in south london near the great north woods um and now i've moved to the, the edge of the sussex weald that sounds a lot more romantic than than it is i'm not in the forest i'm in a town <laughs> but um but th there's loads of roads around here like hammer pond road and there's lots of streams that um come that come down from the high weald um and they've been dammed um and they would been they have been dammed for um long ago for the production of um the sussex wheeled iron industry um so mm. yeah it's 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 very interesting in that respect um you just before we move on to the great north wood you were talking about the industrial revolution could you just um sort of confirm what sort of time you know when when that took place we're talking about the late 18th century and into the 19th and it does appear that a lot of species declines have actually been linked back to that period it's not just and I know there's been a lot of species declined and uh, declines with things like nightingales in the past, well, even like the past 20 or 30 years. But um, the, the impacts of the Industrial Revolution on the landscape has kind of started something that we're still living through, isn't it? Um, so, yeah, moving on to the Great North Wood and just kind of trying to understand exactly what it is. Uh, what is the Great North Wood um, and why is it called the Great North Wood? Well, now this is interesting and it's um, in a way slightly embarrassing because everybody knows it or everyone involved knows it is the Great North Wood and uh, that's the name of the lottery funded uh, project that the London Wildlife Trust have been running. But I can find no record of it being called the Great North Wood before about 1863 in the records of the Surrey Archaeological Society. On every old map and document I've looked at before that, it's either the North Wood or Norwood. Uh, no great. So it's, uh, it's kind of ironic that uh, the epithet great was only applied to it just as it was sort of fading into history. Uh, so I suppose it's a product of Victorian romanticism. Uh, but 
It was called the Northwood because, as I mentioned before, uh, parts of it were owned by the Manor of Croydon, which in turn was owned by the Archbishop of Canterbury, and it was north of Croydon. Uh, so they called it the Northwood or Norwood, which has given us the name of the suburb. Uh, interestingly enough, the area around uh, what was Sydenham Common, which wasn't so densely wooded, it was kind of semi-wooded pasture, that actually belonged to the Priory of Lewisham. Uh, and so it was called the Westwood because it was west of Lewisham. And of course, Westwood is still a street name in the area. I grew up in a house that was built on Westwood Common, <laughs> um, or the Westwood. Um, so yeah, that, that name only made sense to me maybe about 10 years ago or something. So that, that was really interesting. Um, is it, it's also, I'm, um, I'm being a bit biased here. I've mentioned the Sussex Weald. I also read somewhere that it, it might be called the Northwood because it was north of the Sussex Weald, which was, which is still one of the most wooded parts in the, of the country, but was once much more kind of impenetrable. Um, is there any evidence of, of that as well? Well, um, I mean, obviously the northernmost part of the Weald is, is just to the south of Croydon. So I, I guess the Croydonites called it the Northwood in order to differentiate it from those woods down south. One of the, the things I like about your book is the, I think every time you have a place name, you say what it means. And I think that mm -hmm. is one of the things that particularly people who live in South London are really interested in about local history. Um, and Croydon, can you tell us what Croydon means? Oh, uh, yes, it's the Valley of Crocuses, because apparently they used to grow them for saffron round there. That, yeah, that's interesting as well, because um, I know there's some London Wildlife Trust Nature Reserves like Hutchinson's Bank, which is in New Addington, um, mm. and the chalk down and around there um, in Croydon. It does actually, I mean, it has meadow saffron growing there, which I think is wild. Um, ah. Yeah, so perhaps they cultivated the wild plants. I mean, I'd need to double check, but I'm pretty I'm sure, sure it's... sure they did, yes. Yeah. yeah. Because, of course, saffron is, uh, was, and is still a very expensive uh, condiment, spice or whatever it really is, because it's the stamens of the, uh, of the plant. So really, it should be, it should be um, renamed Croydon Spice. Yeah. Which is probably the name of a nightclub in East Croydon. I was going to say, it might not have quite the right connotation. <laughs> well, Chris, if, if, um, if the writing career doesn't work out, you could become a nightclub owner and open Croydon Spice. Um, maybe not. So how did you get to know the Great North Woods? Because you obviously, to write a book like this, you need to have a fair amount of substantial knowledge and interest in the area itself. And obviously you live, um, you live, pretty much in in the historic um sort of territory should we say of the great northwood um yes but yeah how did you really get to know the landscape well i i mean i visited uh Sydney and dulwich woods on and off for years and then in 2011 i started volunteering there and uh you know, in the course of volunteering and you know, chatting to other volunteers and reading up on the subject, I, you know, learned that, it, you know, it's part of the larger Northwood. And so, uh, um, yeah, I became intrigued. I started collecting old maps, uh, not, not the originals, unfortunately, uh, but, you know, digital copies and you know working out how they related to the modern street map and uh where the surviving fragments of the wood were and i mean there was a sort of um back in the 1990s um our friend and colleague matthew frith started a friends of the great north wood uh to attempt to raise awareness of all the surviving parts of it and to sort of treat them in a holistic way. And uh, that project has sort of obviously been significantly revised, but revived by the, uh, by the trust 
with the aid of the Heritage Lottery funding. Um, and there was a pamphlet uh, put together by Lucy Neville back in, I think it was as early as 1987, which contained a map of the former extent of the wood. Uh, so that kind of got me interested. And I mean, that's that's very good and very, it's very good and well-researched little booklet. But uh, obviously uh, there was much, much more that could be said and, uh, so I started. I started investigating. There was also the only other publication on the wood as a whole was published by a Croydon historian called John Corbett Anderson in 1898, printed by private subscription, um, called the Great North Wood, uh, which again is interesting. Uh, although obviously it doesn't cover the last uh, 120 years. <laughs> And since it was published, and um, you know, that too misses out quite a bit. Uh, but it's a, it's a useful book, and I've quoted from it uh, in my own in places. Yeah, um, it's important that we mention Matthew Frith, <laughs> who um, has been involved with London Wildlife Trust and in the Great North Wood for a very long time. I think he, he likes to tell you quite often, actually. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And I think he's been, he's been involved definitely over 30 years. Um, but Matthew, if you're listening, um, it'd be great to get you on here. And I, I think there might be an opportunity for that. So, um, so yeah. Um, so Chris, you volunteered at Sydenham Hill Wood, um, yes. which of course is the most, it's kind of the tourist attraction of the Great North Wood, isn't it? Well, I suppose, you know, Streatham Common is, is also Great North Wood. There's lots yeah. of parks and, places that people don't realize are great northward um but i wanted to ask you just to to set it out in people's minds um if you were to walk the perimeter of the great northward as it is today which places what would your route be what which places would you pass through oh goodness well you'd probably start the new cross where there used to be hatch and wood and you'd head south to Brockley. From there, you'd sort of more or less follow the course of the railway to uh, One Tree Hill in Honor Oak, uh, which was the uh, Oak of Arnon Hill and was very much part of the Great North Wood. Uh, from there, you'd head south past the Horniman Museum up Sydenham Rise, along the crest of Sydenham Hill. You'll have Sydenham Hill Wood on your right, and uh, as you progress on your left, you'll have uh, Crystal Palace Park, which was uh, which was wooded until the Crystal Palace was uh, transported there. Uh, I'll take you down the hill into Penge. Let me think. Um, from there, I mean, this doesn't necessarily take you through all the surviving parts of the wood, but around the perimeter of it, uh, you would head down to, uh, well, pretty much down White Horse Lane with uh, Grangewood Park on your right, which was part of the White Horse Estate. And you can still see there's still a magnificent stand of oaks in Grangewood Park that towers over White Horse Lane. And from there, you go to Selhurst, which was sort of more or less the southern edge of the wood. You know, once once the, the ground lowers, you know, and you come down off the hill. And then you'd have to turn around via west and then north again, uh, pretty much up London Road, through Thornton Heath, through Streatham, uh, through Brixton, um, and you probably then head east through Loughborough Junction, where uh, the Milkwood Estate, which was wooded until the Civil War in the 17th century. Uh, then from there, back towards Peckham and uh, New Cross. So it's a big 
chunk of South East London. Yeah, there's some there's some great place names in there, aren't there? Because um, Broccoli is becoming a very popular, quite hip place <laughs> to live. Mm. Um, but what does Broccoli mean? Oh, it's uh, it, it references it, it references badgers. Yeah, and um, I've got some friends who live in Catford, and um, th- they've had badgers at the bottom of their garden. So, um, you know, but that, and that's not too far from from Broccoli. So maybe they are still around. So, Chris, what made you want to write this book? What made me want to write the book? Well, I suppose I started gathering information for that little film I made and I realized that there was you know much more to it and then I just got sort of fascinated uh, I was amazed at actually at how much documentary evidence actually survived and uh, I don't think that is always the case uh, with uh, well particularly with woodlands and so on uh, but as as I mentioned before you know you have two institutions that still exist today in which uh, are fairly efficient at keeping records. So uh, I was able to uncover an awful lot of information. And then there was there was other stuff in the National Archives. Absolutely fascinating. I mean, it's there's a reference in Lucy Neville's book to a court case between um, Elizabeth Ryden and the Archbishop of Canterbury over the uh, ownership of a wood in Penge. Uh, but once I actually managed to track that down to the original uh, documents, which are the uh, witness statements and judgments in uh, a case that was heard in the Court of Exchequer in 1578, uh, discovered there was a whole lot more to it than that. Uh, the um, Penge at that time actually belonged to the was a little island of land belonging to the manor of Battersea, uh, where it's a long way from Battersea. Uh, it was awarded to the manor of Battersea by one of the Anglo-Saxon kings, uh, principally for the reason that it was wooded and uh, Battersea was, in those days, was is low lying and in those days was very marshy. And apart from the sort of trees like this and willows that you get along the riverbank, it didn't have a lot of useful timber. So uh, it owned Penge, and Penge remained part of Battersea until the 1899 Local Government Act, can you believe, which also created the County of London. Um, But so it was an exclave of Battersea. Uh, But this copies lay on the border between Penge and Croydon. Uh, The Battersea was actually... um, direct possession of the monarch, but its tenant, uh, now the tenant of the monarch was known as the king or queen's farmer. Uh, And they were in effect the lord of the manor, if not in name. Uh, This chap, Henry Ryden, felled a coppice uh, on the borders of Penge and Croydon. The Archbishop of Canterbury got to hear about it. Uh, and sent his men to confiscate the coppice wood, which was then carted off to the yard of the Archbishop's Palace in Croydon. Um, the the Rydens then sued, but by the time it came to court, both Henry Ryden and the Archbishop, who was Matthew Parker, had both died. So the case was brought in the name of uh, Henry Ryden's widow, Elizabeth Ryden. Uh, and there are sheets and sheets and sheets of witness statements from people both from Croydon and from Kench, each asserting that, you know, it was always part of their patch. Um, and, and, you know, the long, long sheets, mostly on parchment, uh, with, you know, there must have been about 30 witnesses all giving their accounts. And they talk about the beating of the bounds of the parish, where the priest and the vestrymen and a number of teenage boys and very old men would walk around 
every few years would walk around the boundary with the parish, uh, hitting boundary stones and boundary trees with sticks and carving crosses on them. And they'd also beat the kids in order to uh, fix the boundary in their memories. That was why they had, you know, young boys with them to, you know, carry the memory forward as far as possible in the future and why they had the very old men to remember back as far as possible. So, you know, you get this incredible account of these, um, they, they also call them perambulations, of these perambulations. And, and um, by the way, an awful lot of drink was taken in the course of them. So as you can imagine, there are some conflicting memories and there are occasions when they get lost uh, or they find that, you know, the path they were a long few years ago has got overgrown and they have to make a detour. Um, in the end, the court found in favour of the Rydens. Uh, and I suspect that's probably because they were direct tenants of the Queen. And, uh, you know, in the end, you know, they, they weren't going to uh, challenge the Queen's right to that property. Um, but you know, all this fascinating detail just started sort of emerging, you know, as I got deeper and deeper into the research. And I just thought, you know, I thought it was important that we had a book uh, that would be kind of legacy of the Great Northwood Project and that would actually be a, a modern history of the wood as far back as, as possible to write it and, uh, and as up to the minute as is possible within the uh, publishing schedule. But also, you know, it soon became apparent that this was, this was going to be more than just a sort of, you know, an informational handbook. It was quite a vivid and, you know, even swashbuckling story at times. Yeah, the, <laughs> I'm struggling to get over the um, information about the fact that boys would have been basically beaten underneath these um, oak trees. I presume they would have been oak trees. Um, but I suppose it's an improvement in what the Druids used to do to people um, underneath ancient oak trees. Um, yeah. Long ago. But maybe let's not get into that. Um, but, I, I, yeah, I mean, I think one of the things for me, um, you know, having grown up in the area but not really been aware of the woods until I was in my 20s, um, mm. I think one of the things I love is the name of the book, the book that the book that built London, the wood that built London, because people don't necessarily always think about the origins of London. And nowadays, we you know we we often just think this. Um, we're used to stuff just coming out of thin air, thin air and being on the shelves and stuff. But you know that the resources, the natural resources from this woodland, have really been crucial to the development of London, haven't they? Um, and I just wondered if you, well, absolutely, yeah, and if you could tell us some more about what the kind of the most significant industries in the Great Northwood were and how they fed into London. Yes, I and mean, principally, it was the production of coppice wood for the uh, various um, uses that I've described, uh, and especially charcoal. Uh, I mean, the charcoal burners actually set up their kilns in the wood, and. Uh, burned the charcoal there. Uh, Croydon was well known as a centre of uh, centre of charcoal burning and uh, you know, Grimes, the collier of Croydon, uh, features in a number of Elizabethan and Jacobean plays um, as a sort of semi-comic figure. Um, of course, charcoal was needed for Blacksmiths, bakeries, glass making, brick and tile making. So, you know, prior to the widespread use of coal, uh, it was pretty much essential for everything. Then when you think that prior to the Great Fire of London, most houses in the city were built of timber, uh, now, oak beams would have been necessary for construction purposes to provide the frame. Uh, uh, coppice wood would not provide that, uh, but 
under a statute of Henry VIII, they had to leave 12 trees to grow to full height for every acre of coppice. That was reserved for the navy, but uh, elsewhere, freestanding oaks would have been felled to uh, provide the structural framework of the houses. But the infill between it was made of uh, wattle, you know, woven uh, branches with vertical twigs, which was then covered with coarse plaster, you know, the white bits in a Tudor house, basically. Uh, so basically wood was needed for just about everything. You know, the city was more or less built of wood. Uh, the main source of fuel was wood. Uh, people lit their homes with uh, bundles of twigs known as bavins. Um, they would sweat them with besom brooms made of a coppice bowl and a number of twigs. So everything from the wood was used. Uh, the oak bark was used for tanning leather. Uh, the tanneries were located in Bermondsey because they'd been banished from the city because of the smell. Um, yeah, the twigs would have been used for fire lighters, for for brushes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you know, it was it was incredibly uh, efficient in that way. And really, yes, prior to the Industrial Revolution, the, the city was uh, utterly dependent on timber. I mean, obviously, the Northwood was not the only source of timber for the city of London. I mean, you, but Epping Forest was um, was a royal forest. Um, you know, in the sense that it was. Uh, closed for hunting so uh you know common people would be were not allowed to trespass there and were not allowed to gather wood from it uh a bit further west you do have uh middlesex forest of which uh or the middlesex wood of which highgate wood and queenswood are survivals that would certainly have been managed in a similar way and uh provided material for the capital so I think those are the two main sources, north and south. Yeah, that, that's interesting. You mentioned um, north of the river. Um, my mum grew up in uh, in Camden, and um, when she was a little girl, she used to go to Queen's Wood um, and play with her siblings, I think. Um, but mm -hmm. you mentioned Epping Forest, which, of course, is an amazing place, a really, really special place. Um, it's interesting there because you've got these amazing ancient beech pollards um, and pollards being trees that, whereas a coppice is cut at the base, of course, a pollard is cut um, to where the branch leaves the trunk, so to speak. So it kind of when it's all cut back, it looks like a fist. But in the Great North Wood, you don't get naturally occurring um, beech beech woodlands or um the only because in the in the sussex weald you get you actually get naturally occurring beech woodland um, and you, you get a lot of ancient beech pollard trees you also get a lot of very old oak trees but it's interesting that the northwood didn't really have that and the only from what i know the only beech trees they're the old ones are victorian plantings aren't they they are, yes. Well, the Norwood Ridge is clay. Um, beach tends to favour chalk and limestone soils. Um, it does not, its roots can't get a very good purchase on clay, which is why uh, several of those uh, beech trees that were planted in Victorian times have fallen over in recent years. Once they reach a certain height, the uh, the soil can't support their weight. Uh, the ecological niche that's normally filled by beech trees on you know chalk or limestone is occupied on clay by uh, hornbeam, which is the after the sessile oak is the second tree of the north wood uh, and grows as you know very plentifully in uh, particularly in Sydenham Hill wood but also in Dulwich wood. It used to be known as the horse beach because, the, you know, the leaves are rather similar and it's sometimes mistaken for a beach. Uh, hornbeam, it, yeah, definitely is. Um, 
amazing autumn colour. I I must say I've missed that um, from you don't there's very few places i think that you really get that yellow beat um not beat so hornbeam um mm-hmm. some color because i remember ashley white who uh used to be the conservation officer at sydenham hill wood she said that when she moved into the southwest she really missed the hornbeam in the autumn mm-hmm. and it's interesting because in sussex it's quite it's not yes it's uh, not as strong I don't know about the whole of Sussex, but in part of the wheel that I live near to, um, it's not dominant in the way that it is in, particularly in Sydenham Hill and Dulwich Wood. Yeah, no, it tends to grow mostly in southeast England and uh, on on clay uplands. Uh, I think I think you can find it as far north as Norfolk, but not much further than that. And quite a lot of hornbeams in the Chilterns as well. But again, not much west of there. Yeah, in Norfolk, they used to call it hard beam, didn't they? Yes. Well, that's what that horn beam means, yeah, because the wood is very, very hard and uh, it's not much good for sort of, you know, delicate joinery or anything like that. But it's useful for things like mallets and chopping boards and so forth. But it also makes excellent charcoal, which, you know, is also significant given the uh, given the fact that much charcoal was sourced within the Great North Wood. Uh, it burns at very high temperature, so it's actually quite useful for sort of stuff like smelting iron. Yeah, which is probably maybe why there's not so much of it in, in the Sussex Wheel because they chopped it all down in the seventeen. Uh, 17- oh, you may well be right about that. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Um, which is a shame, um, but yeah, can't go. Well, with that. if they were going to, if they were going to use it industrially, surely they would coppice it because the whole point of coppicing is that it's renewable. Uh, you know, you don't want to eradicate, uh, you know, a useful source of material. No, I, I don't think I've ever seen much in the way of hornbeam coppice stools around here. I've, there's a wood in Kent, which has got quite a lot of it on the North Downs, um, called Kingswood, and they've got these very interesting old hornbeam um, coppards. I think they call them halfway between a coppice and a pollard or something like that. Um, but w- while we're talking about um, old trees, one of the things I've, I thought was really interesting about your book um, that hasn't really i think one of the main things that interests me so much about your book is that it has a lot of information that hasn't been published before um and particularly about certain certain um parts of the landscape that are now gone so particularly the vicar's oak um which is located was located sorry um was at the top of annerley hill in crystal palace yes it's uh that it's the crossroads there uh, yes. And there is a plaque just beside the gate of Crystal Palace Park to say that the Vickers Oak used to stand there. And so this tree, I mean, you can tell us more about it in a second, but this tree was is not there anymore. It was cut down for whatever reason. You've got some interesting stories about people's sort of anger and frustration about that happening. But um, it, th- these sorts of old oak trees as boundary trees, I think you talked about the beating of the bounds and there's like the gospel oaks and stuff like that. I mean, what is the significance in a, almost, we say, in a kind of spiritual way of these old trees going down through um, British and European history that you know of? Well, I mean, I think just on a practical level, they served as landmarks but I think they were also, you know, a defining part of people's identity. I mean, the, where the, the Vicar's Oak actually stood at the meeting point of five parishes, uh, Camberwell, Lambeth, Croydon, Battersea, in the form of its exclave at Penge, and uh, uh, so that was one of the most significant boundary trees. There were others. There was the nearby, there was uh, Low Cross Oak, there was Dead Man's Oak, and there was the Elder Oak, which 
grew in an elder bush. Um, all these trees are mentioned in various documents from the 16th and 17th centuries, including the trial that I was talking about. Uh, but the Vickers Oak was the largest and the most prominent of, of them. Uh, some witnesses said that it could be seen from 10 to 12 miles away, and one even claimed you could see it from Harrow on the Hill, uh, which is actually 17 miles to the northwest. So it must have been vast. And it seems to have been cut down sometime around 1678 uh, when John Aubrey, the um, historian and antiquary, uh, made his um, biographer of Isaac Walton uh, when he made his perambulation of Surrey. Uh, he, he noted that it had already been cut down and there was considerable anger about it. Um, do you know why it was cut down? No, nothing to say why. I mean, there are references to boundary trees having been felled. Uh, there was one that was allegedly felled by somebody from Penge. And the Croydonites alleged that he'd filled it in order to obscure where the boundary was. So that's one possible motive. To obscure where the boundary was, that's just, that's, I mean, it's quite sinister, I suppose, isn't it? Someone, maybe someone trying to, trying to profit or whatever. Well, exactly, yes. I mean, it's, it's quite an act of violence, isn't it, to, to do something like that to a, such a significant tree. I mean, if that happened today, I mean, you, at the moment, there's the whole issue with um, HS2 and you've got people living in trees to try and stop them from being cut down. And um, I know there's been the issue um, in Sydenham Hill Wood with the two oak trees either side of the footbridge, yes. which obviously is a complicated issue. We can't really, can't really cover that fully here. But um, the, the, great, the Great North Wood has, from, you know, from reading your book, I did know a little bit about before. It's got quite a violent history, doesn't it? Particularly before the the um, the creation of the Dulwich Estates in um, sixteen or seventeen hundreds. I'm not sure. Could you could you tell us more about you know what happened to the local people who really depended on that on the the commons and woods of the of the of the Great North Wood and, and what happened in the seventeenth and eighteenth century? There was an increasing uh, movement to enclose common land. Uh, landowners and uh, agronomists thought that the the established practices of the common, whereby people could, you know, collect firewood and graze their animals on it, were inefficient, and uh, they thought that say uh, they needed improving, and uh, that meant enclosing them and absorbing them into their land. And certainly, where it comes to the Northwood. Yeah, I mean, the first significant attempt to uh, enclose part of the Great North Wood took place in uh, 1607, when uh, a couple of local landowners, who also happened to be courtiers of King James I, uh, <coughs> sought his permission to um, enclose Sydenham Common. Uh, it was more than about 340 something acres. Uh, there were great protests about this, and it actually went to court, and uh, they were defeated, but they kept trying. And um, eventually, the vicar of Lewisham, a man called Abraham Colf, who founded Colf School, uh, organised uh, a protest, but uh, which was ultimately successful. Uh, their attempt to enclose the land was defeated, but not before... Uh, <laughs> People had been driven off it. Uh, their livestock had been slaughtered. Uh, sheep's carcasses had been draped over bushes. Uh, there was a great deal of violence and intimidation going on. Uh, that attempt was, as I said, was ultimately defeated. But certainly the enclosure process sort of gathered pace throughout the 18th century and certainly towards the end of the 18th century and the early years of the 19th century, virtually all common lands in England, including uh, those in Croydon, Lambeth and so on, were enclosed and uh, 
This, of course, is occurring at the time of the, uh, you know, the southward expansion of London. So uh, that actually paved the way for their development, building development in the 19th century. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, London obviously is very, very built up, air pollution issues. Um, it's a great city to live in, um, but some people probably would think of the Northwood as this wonderful rural idyll um, to return to, and wouldn't that be much better? But you know, it, it was a it was a dangerous place, wasn't it? It, it wasn't it wasn't all kind of sweetness and, and light. It wasn't like visiting a national trust garden. I, I would expect. Oh goodness, no! I mean, you know, well into the nineteenth century, it was you know it was a dangerous place. <laughs> And the thing is that, um, as I said, as you know, it was on the edge of five parishes. So it was well away from the uh, centres of habitation, at least until the 19th century. Uh, um, woodland tends to survive uh on on the margins of parishes i think it's oliver rackham who pointed that out and that's where even today we tend to find ancient woodland uh, but that meant that although there were there would be people working in the wood during the day uh woodsmen and colliers and so on at night it was deserted and well there were smugglers coming up from the kent and sussex coast uh bringing their uh their goods to london um quite a lot of there are quite a lot of uh newspaper records from the late 18th early 19th century of uh highwaymen uh robbing travelers in or close to the woods uh there was in 1803 there was the uh murder of the hermit samuel matthews in the woods um no they were they could be a violent place and uh, you know these were pretty lawless times as well uh i mean violence was not just i mean it well obviously i mean it came all the way down from the level of the state to uh the way private individuals would settle disputes Bringing it back to kind of present day, um, in a sense, we've got, we're obviously living through a pandemic at the moment. Um, but I was interested in your in your reference to um, Daniel Defoe and his account of the plague in 1665. Yeah, um, could you tell us a bit more about what what went down during that um, pandemic? Well, according to Defoe, a lot of uh, people tried to escape London into the woods uh, because obviously they were accessible and sparsely populated. Um, some of them were already infected. Uh, he said the local people wouldn't help them for fear of infection and many died there. And he mentions in Dulwich and Lewisham um, and Norwood. Um, there is also the case of a vicar of Croydon, uh, his parishioners protested. They actually published a pamphlet complaining about him, that during the, uh, they complained about his ex extortionate tithes, which he spent uh, in a house of ill repute in Newington. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and uh, he was basically during the plague, he was burying the parishioners in the woods, but charging them as much as he would have buried them in the churchyard. That was their complaint against him. He was actually, the case went all the way to the Archbishop of Canterbury and ultimately King Charles II, and eventually he was moved from the parish. Uh, but uh, so that gives you some picture of what must have gone on then. I suppose on a sort of lighter note, I wanted to ask you who, we, I mean, we talked about Daniel Defoe there. Um, I know many people wouldn't call him a celebrity, but, you know, this is the, we are talking about sort of medieval woodlands and stuff here. But 
who were the Great Northwood celebrities? What, in historical times? Um, yes, I, I don't mean the BBC news presenters who you often see walking there in present day. Well, I mean, obviously, um, well, not obviously, I mean, Byron was, before he went to Harrow School, was at Dr. Glenny's Academy, which stood where the Grove Tavern now is, at the junction of London Road and uh, Dulwich Common. And he is supposed to have walked up across his walk to go and hang out with the gypsies in the woods. Uh, Robert Browning, as a young man, who of course grew up in Camberwell, uh, used to walk in the woods at night and would compose his poetry there. Uh, Ruskin, uh, who of course lived in Herne Hill, just over the road from where I am now, uh, was a great... Um, was a huge fan of the woods and was absolutely furious when the Crystal Palace was uh, built there, uh, forever ruining the view, he said. Um, who else is associated with it? Well, the French Impressionist painter Camille Pissarro uh, painted View of a Train from the uh, from the Coxes, Oak, Coxes Walk footbridge, uh, although you can see a bit of trees off to the left, but at the time the uh, embankments uh, were bare. I mean, they'd only, it was only, the railway was only five or six years old, so they hadn't really, there wasn't much regrowth. Uh, about 25 years later, Emil Zola lived in Norwood, in the Queen's Hotel, uh, to escape imprisonment for his defence of uh, Dreyfus. And uh, he was a keen photographer. And uh, actually some of his photos show parts of the woods. Uh, there's one of his wife standing underneath an oak tree. Um, yeah, Z Zola, um, I remember reading about him and some of his photos were being advertised a couple of years ago. I think maybe someone, there's like a blog post or a new, newspaper article about it. Mm -hmm. um, Moving more to the kind of nature's celebrity, should we say, one of the things I really liked reading about were the, um, the quite unique species records that you've uncovered that I don't think I've ever heard of before. Um, you, you managed to find some pretty rare butterfly records. Um, so, for example, oh, yeah. um, the Duke of Burgundy, um, the Glanville Fritillary, mm -hmm. and the Marsh Fritillary, which um, the Duke of Burgundy is, I think it, I think it's one of the definitely one of the rarest butterflies in, in Britain. Uh, it's got a very particular um, taste. All these butterflies seem to the, the rarest ones seem to have quite particular requirements, should we say? Um, mm -hmm. They seem to be coming back in in Sussex and the South Downs quite well. Um, but yeah, marsh artillery and Glanville artillery very very rare indeed. And I th I'm just wondering, are you going to um, log on to the green space information? the Greater London website and, and log the log the records from the 1700s or something like that. Just I was going to say, they were rather a long time ago. That um, was, I'm trying to think, that was John Ray, was it not, who spotted the uh, Glanville Fritillary? I think so, yeah. Yes. But, I mean, He's sort of late 17th, early 18th century. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting, it just shows you how much the landscape has changed, really, and of course, it's not just, I mean, it's obviously changed <laughs> um, quite a lot, but um, it would have been uh, that sort of landscape now, if it had those species in it, would probably be, have a very high, it would be, it'd certainly be a site of special scientific interest or a national nature reserve. But, um, Absolutely, yeah. Um, and also, as uh, I'm a big fan of fungi, an interest which I, I developed in the Great Northwood. Um, mm. And I was very interested to read that in 1724, there were fungal forays going on. And I, you noted that it was mainly Amanita mushrooms that were found. So they're some of the, the more poisonous ones. So they include right. things like the death cap and destroying angel, but also uh, fly agaric, which is the, the, the super Mario red and white mushroom. Mm -hmm. and that, that was really interesting to read that. Yes, I believe most of these are from uh, William Curtis's Flora Londoniensis, which was published in the second half of the 
18th century. Um, I mean, he was interested in plants in general. And of course, people in those days thought fungi were plants. It's relatively recent discovery that they are a kingdom of their own. Uh, but yes, um, the thing about these old records is, fascinating as they are, and valuable as it is to know that, you know, such uh, a species was present all that long time ago, um, they're not really done on in a in the systematic way that we now do our modern surveys and transects, in that they quite often relied on correspondents writing to them about what they'd seen on their walks. And uh, they didn't necessarily follow the same path at regular intervals, you know. So there was a there's a huge element of chance in it. So you know, we can't really treat them in the same way that we do treat, uh, you know, well, like the giggle information or something like that. Uh, one of the things Curtis quotes, oh, it's actually on One Tree Hill, some of the fungi there. Or, no, it was a walk from London to Dulwich of a friend of his, you know, like 30 years earlier or something like that. So there is a haphazardness about these early records. You know, this is the sort of kind of, they're just beginning to develop a scientific methodology. I mean, it becomes more reliable in the 19th century, but at the same time, it is fascinating for all that, uh, you know, to know that, well, you know, that some species that we have now were there back then. Uh, that, that makes me laugh um, because <laughs> there's a, a long-term volunteer involved at Sydenham Hill Wood, Chris, who you know well, called... Um, Ernie Thomason, and um, I just remember when I remember many, many, many times he would talk about, oh, 30 years ago, there was this, that, or the other, and I suppose he's kind of the continuation of a trend. Then, absolutely, um, mm. great, great servant to the woods that Ernie is. Um, if you're listening, Ernie, hello, hope you're doing well. And I, another thing I thought was really interesting was you talked about the hybridization of English bluebell with Spanish, which is something that you know, modern day conservationists are really worried about. And it's been it, it's been going on since the 1700s. Yes. Yeah. So, so it seems expressing concern about it. And um, interestingly enough, the ringneck parakeet, which everybody thinks is a very recent phenomenon, um, it's certainly is. I think it's J.D. Powers book on the ornithology of Norwood uh, notes them in the 1890s. Is that is that the one where it has a fight with a cuckoo? Uh, no, I don't think so. No, uh, that's great. No. <laughs> yeah, is that is that the um, ornithological notes from a South London suburb? I think that's it. Yeah. Oh, that that's absolute gold. That book, um, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, because that that tells you that Ryneck was nesting on. Um, in Dulwich on Cox's Walk in something like 1904, I think. That, that's the one, yes. Yeah, and I mean, that's Ryneck is now extinct as a breeding bird in Britain. Mm. Um, it, it's really interesting because it shows you that um, the species just changed, don't they? I mean, there's things that we have now that we have now in the Great Northwood that were not there and, and vice versa, but there's actually a lot, there wouldn't have been any peregrines around, I don't think. There's not many records of things like that. Whereas, you know, they do, you find them on the church spires and places like Forest Hill, don't you? So, yeah, indeed, yeah. There, there weren't even any magpies or hardly any because they'd been practically persecuted to the brink of extinction uh, by gamekeepers. Uh, it's only after this. Second World War and really since the 1970s that they've made such a dramatic comeback. Yeah, that was really shocking, actually. I think I've read about something similar. It might have been in um, Rebirding, um, a, a book about rewilding uh, Benedict McDonald's book. I think he writes in that about the kind of extermination of species in the countryside. But it's really shocking. Like the, um, I, I, would, I noted how hedgehogs were one of the, the prime targets for extermination and people would pay to have them removed. Um, and also these records of polecat, um, which is now a rare 
mammal in Britain and you only I know I think it is actually increasing again but um it's only really one that you find having been hit by a car I, I found one when I was walking in Horton and Ribblesdale in the Yorkshire Dales mm. it was just dead on um not not near a road it was near a river it was just lying there but that's the only one I've ever seen mm. but it just goes to show you the kind of level of extermination and things that are actually now really rare. Well, exactly. Yes. I mean, you mentioned the, uh, you know, that people were paid for hedgehogs. This, this came about as a result of the so-called Tudor Vermin Acts, which were passed by Henry VIII and then a um, much broader one by Elizabeth, which basically gave the parishes money, which they would distribute to people who brought in uh, dead, quote unquote, vermin, which could be hedgehogs, polecats, as you mentioned, badgers, uh, a whole range of birds, uh, crows, rooks, uh, even bullfinches, because they supposedly strip the buds from fruit trees. Basically, anything that was thought to compete with human beings for resources was classified as vermin, and people were people were paid to kill them uh, and i think it was sort of probably a you know handy source of inf income for the poorer parishioners uh you know to make a few pence killing a few hedgehogs hedgehogs they used to believe um sucked the milk from sleeping cattle <laughs> that's the same with um night jars isn't it because yeah, the well, they, 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 they were called goat suckers yeah cat, the latter name is caprimulgus yeah um, that's that means goat sucker, doesn't it? Don't they? Don't they call um, in America? Is it in America they call them goat suckers as well? I know they call them whipper wills. I think that's probably yeah. I don't know, might, might be the Native American name, but um, goat sucker is definitely. I mean, yeah. Well, so what was that all about then? Because night jars were in the Great North Wood, weren't they? They certainly were. Yes. Um, well, it was the same thing. You know, people had these mistaken beliefs that don't know how they came about. But, uh, you know, and that merited their inclusion on the list of animals to be persecuted. So having said that, going through the records, particularly the Camberwell, I don't think it was done that efficiently or systematically. Um, I think the species loss we've experienced is probably more to do with uh, industrial agriculture in the 20th century. Just going through those Camberwell records, you know, they... They weren't really killing enough to keep pace with their rate of reproduction. No, I, no I noted that you said that in the book, um, and I do agree with you. I mean, the evidence does show that the species declines because of habitat loss um, mm -hmm. and a lack of biomass within insect populations. So there's not enough food for other animals. Yeah. So I've got um, I've got a couple more questions for you before we finish. And mm -hmm. um, while we're talking about the Great North Woods, I just wondered what you, th how you think people look back at the Great North Wood in a hundred years as it is today. Goodness. Um, well, I've no idea where we'll be in a hundred years from now, apart from anything else. You know, given the climate emergency. But uh, presuming that everything doesn't, you know, go horribly awry, uh, I think people will probably look back. They will look back on the campaigners who saved it and, uh, you know, the trust that's uh, cared for it. In much the way we look back on sort of, you know, the kind of Victorian reformers, people like Octavia Hill and so on, who fought to save Hampstead Heath and so forth. And, uh, you know, it will be a, ooh, well, it may all be, always be something that is taken for granted the way um, Hampstead Heath is taken for granted now. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, hopefully they will continue to exist and thrive. And hopefully, you know, we may have been able by then to create more sort of kind of wildlife corridors connecting them, you know, which can be done via hedges and so on. You can put hedgehog tunnels under roads uh, so that the habitats are less fragmented, uh, which, of course, is uh, in itself a problem for uh, non-flying mammals uh, because their genetic diversity declines and leaves them more susceptible to disease and other problems. Yeah, you've mentioned London Wildlife just there, and, and I'm 
we uh, we've talked a lot more about the detail of of your research and stuff. That's what I wanted to focus on today because um, I am hopeful of London Wildlife Trust coming coming for an episode um, just to talk about their work. But yeah, you know, the Great North Woods, a place like Sydenham Hill Wood, was saved by the campaigning of. London Wildlife Trust in the 1980s and you know, Sydenham Society, Dulwich Society and local Absolutely. people. Um, so that's really important to remember that. And also the, the woods are protected by all the volunteers, uh, Chris, including yourself, who um, who uh, donate their time to uh, to look after the place. Mm -hmm. um, so it's important to remember that. Um, in terms of launching your book, um, what are your hopes for the launch? Well, who knows where we will be. It's, the book's due to be published on the 7th of October. Uh, who knows whether we will be able to have live in-person gatherings by then. But if that were the case, I would certainly, you know, like to launch it. Well, I mean, may well do a central London launch, but I would certainly like to do a launch within the area of the Great North Wood. And possibly a number of events such as talks uh, to uh, all the various local friends groups, you know, the friends of Big In Woods and so on, uh, so that, you know, everyone gets to oh, see themselves, their own efforts reflected in it. Yeah, I mean, that, that's one of the things that's refreshing about this book. And I mean, it, it's, it's special interest, isn't it? Because it's it's a local interest but London is such a melting pot of people that um, it will be interesting to a great number of different people. Absolutely. Um, but one of the things that refreshes, is refreshing about reading this book, you know, a lot, a lot of writing about nature is from a certain perspective, isn't it? It's um, from, you didn't talk about what you had for breakfast um, the day that you went to research, <laughs> you know, you, you didn't talk about your, um, you didn't necessarily have exactly from your first first person perspective. It's there's just so much detail in there. I think there will be so much use to people for you know decades to come. People trying to understand the woodland as it changes, which I think is what is so important. It's something that's really been needed. So yeah, that 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 was very refreshing. Well, that was in a way what I set out to achieve, and I, I I wanted to sort of uh, you know gather all the information that's available in between you know one set of covers. Uh, so that it was there as a future reference work. I mean, it's why the book has got uh, endnotes, so that, uh, you know, people in future, you know, can verify my sources and follow them up if they need to. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, there's a certain, obviously, there's a personal perspective on there. And, uh, you know, I've been very involved in the woods for a long time. So, you know, there is, there is, there is a bit of personal writing, particularly towards the end. But you didn't call it my search for the hedgehog hunters or anything like that, <laughs> <laughs> which is what a lot a lot of books nowadays on nature seem to have that sort of title, don't they? But anyway, I'm I'm just I'm just messing around. Um, the, I've got one closing question for you, and it's one that yep. I want to I want want to ask this question to everyone who comes onto the onto the podcast. Um, and I'm not I'm not some um, sort of venture capitalist or anything like that but um <laughs> the question i've got to ask is if you had vast sums of money to invest in an environmental or community projects what would you donate to and why oh my goodness um i think well just because of my own involvement i think i would donate to uh, an urban environmental project because most of our people do live in cities, uh, more than 80%, because if we are going to uh, fight the climate crisis and still have a habitable planet in a few decades' time, we have got to have everybody on board. Uh, and, you know, basically we need to involve diverse urban communities who too long have felt uh, excluded by the sector. Yeah, I fully agree with you, Chris. Um, I'd, I'd love to see see that kind of investment in urban um, community projects and environmental projects. And definitely the conservation sector has a lot to do. It's the second least diverse um, in Britain next to farming. Um, but yeah, it's the one that's, that has some of the most kind of emotional capital because it's about conserving nature and and 
the thing that you know the very thing that we depend on to survive so well that takes us to the the end of our conversation today um is there anything else you'd like to add before we go no, thanks thanks daniel it's been great talking to you thanks chris wishing you all the best and hopefully well in time for your book launch might be able to have a um, something in, in person and we can get through this these difficult times but <laughs> the pub yeah sorry um, lo looking i'm looking forward to reading the rest of your book and i'm sure there's loads of people out there who are, are going to be really keen to read it and really enjoy it so thank you so much for writing it and uh i really wish much. you all the best with that yeah thanks daniel okay cheers chris bye yes